If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Motherfucking mind pump. Oh. That's right, motherfucker. For the first, how do you start it off with that? We go right into Sal's yeah. uh, his daughter's stand up routine. Yeah. Oh, and Sal, it was such a sweet story. Yeah, we talked about my daughter's stand up routine at the talent show. A lot of crying going on between you two bitches lately. It Justin was, crying at the expo. Hey, man, hey, could, hey, hey, yeah. Hey. Yeah. I know. If we see, if we ever see Adam uh, cry, right. I can't wait. I'll videotape. He, he breaks a nail. Uh, we talk about fear and courage. We talk about the outliers in society and why we uh, why we identify with some of people. them. We talk about Kanye and the black male approval of Trump. New study just came out, a Reuters poll. It shows that Trump's approval rate among black men has mm -hmm. doubled. Is that the, the Kanye effect? Crazy. Yeah. We talk about the origin of my interest in politics. And we talk about the economics of war. We also mention... Orgasmify, excuse me, <laughs> Organify. Hey. Hey. It's getting interesting. Got okay. a good commercial for you today. Listen, you, green juice may just uh, increase the volume of your semen. As uh, if you needed more reasons to buy it. Listen to the episode. You'll hear what I'm saying. Uh, anyway, if you go to Organify Shop um, and enter the code Mind Pump, you'll get a huge load of a discount. <laughs> I mean, it's massive. It's, it's shooting out there. Then we get to the first question. Uh, the first question was uh, this female weightlifter is having trouble getting to do her first chin up pull-ups is her weakness she's been doing negatives band and box assisted pull-ups and scat pulls and other kinds of variations and doesn't seem to be able to do a pull-up we give her this secret in this episode you'll be able to do a pull-up in no time you're welcome the next question was uh what are our thoughts on combining resistance training with running now this person Likes to lift weights, but also enjoys running. Finds it therapeutic. How much running each week is too much? It's like, I'm into redheads, I'm into blondes. Ah, I can't decide. You can have them all. <laughs> <laughs> the next question was, Beautiful. Uh, is it possible to integrate a MAPS program with an Olympic lifting program? Okay, so do we have a MAPS program that would complement Olympic lifting? The answer is yes, MAPS Prime, 100%. Here is kind of break it down and break down Olympic lifting in this episode. By the way, Maps Prime, you can find on our website, mindpumpmedia.com. And the next question was, which one of us, I guess this question was between Adam, Justin, myself, and Doug, has the most lean body mass? Uh, we get into discussion about lean body mass when people bulk or when they cut. And are they really succeeding or are they just losing muscle and gaining body fat? We did a little pinch test. You know what I'm saying? We did. Also, this month- Sal didn't bring the numbers out after he pulled the calculator out and figured it out. <laughs> I like, won with- Yeah, he used to calculate it. He was doing mine. He's like, oh, fuck. That's more than I weigh. Fuck oh, his no. case. I won uh, with- We're, we're going to skip past this idea. <laughs> 10 inches was the biggest. Yeah. Uh, then, oh, by the way, this month, you get for free, we're giving this away for free- Free? The intuitive guide and the fasting guide with the enrollment of any bundle. Now, why are we doing this? Are we crazy? We like you guys. Have we lost our minds? Yes. No, it's because uh, summer's almost here, and we know what people try to do when summertime comes around. They want to get sexy, hot, and lean. In that order, sexy, hot, hot and lean. Lean. Now, you're going to have a tough time doing that without proper nutrition. Laid. Let's let's <laughs> let's break it down. That's right. There's a fourth one there. Yeah, that was the fourth. Let's be honest here. It's bonus. Can you get sexy hot and lean with poor nutrition, Adam? Is so it no. needs to. Absolutely not. It's not going to happen. So, we wanted to make sure that people who enrolled in our bundles, which are several maps programs combined and then discounted, we literally slash the fuck out of the price of a bundle. Like a crazy ass girlfriend. <laughs> Gone. Adam slash knows, entire. Adam knows all about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We that key cars, bro. <laughs> we wanted to include those nutrition components for free because that's such an integral part of getting leaner. So again, to be clear, this month enroll in any Maps bundle, you'll get the intuitive nutrition guide and the fasting guide thrown in for absolute free. To get those programs and to learn about them, just go to mindpumpmedia.com. Dude, yesterday was the big day. Yesterday was? Yes. What do you mean? What happened? How the was talent it big? show. Oh. oh, did you guys watch the video? No. No, did you send it to us? Yes. I don't know you didn't. No, you didn't. Lied it it might have not come through. It no, didn't. You, you didn't, didn't see anything, oh, bro. Oh, dude, I can't so. wait to show you How'd guys. How'd your girl do? So, so, 
you know, I'm going to sound like a jerk but talking crap about other kids, but <laughs> <laughs> just the way it is. Whatever. You got just, a, you got an awesome bias. Just the way it is. Yeah. Um, 99.9% of the talent show acts. Remember, my daughter's in second grade. And then this this was the, she was the, one of the youngest. I think the youngest was second grade. And then you got, they went all the way up to eighth grade. Yeah. 99.9% of them falls under three categories. Singing, dancing, or playing an instrument. So that's everything. Everybody goes down there and does one of those things. Here comes my little daughter, my little adorable daughter, with her dress that she picked out and her little boots. Right. She gets behind the mic. Everybody's she, expecting a dance. And or she does a, song. a fucking comedy show. Love it. My second grade little girl goes up there and tells jokes, and everybody laughed. I had all these parents come up to me afterwards and were commenting on her. So check out the learning. Like she's a natural, bro. So great. Check out the and she definitely gets that from her dad. Because her mom's not funny at all, but <laughs> <laughs> at least not on purpose. Yeah. So she, uh, uh, when we were going there to to do the thing, she's like nervous. You could tell she's nervous. Her little, her little. I was picking her up and stuff, and her little armpits were sweating. Her hands were sweating. Did so. you write the jokes for her? No, we 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 went through them, and she, you know, she bounced all. She bounced. Like, where did she get her? Co- where did she get her her stuff from? Well, come on, dude! I tell stupid jokes all the time. So yeah, obviously, he's, from he's got plenty of yeah, dad material. You know what? Her the best joke was what. What's red and bad for your teeth? Red and bad for your teeth. A brick. <laughs> Second grader. Perfect. So, so anyway, just, just straight to the punchline. So, yeah, she walks out and right away she tells a joke and she, you know, people are laughing. But anyway, when we're getting ready for this thing, she's just being honest with me, you know, and she's, I can tell she's nervous. So I'm like, how do you feel? And she's like, my knees are shaking. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, my poor little girl, you know, she's super nervous. Yeah. So I said. I, she goes, I don't think I'm... I don't that's, do you think that's the first time she's ever felt that feeling? Think about that. Maybe, or the first time she was aware of that, right? Right. That that, I mean, the fact that's so cool that she has that awareness that you could have that conversation. Yeah, so I'm so she's, she, and I'm like, this is a great opportunity to teach because she's feeling nervous. Yeah. And so she's like, she said something like, I don't think, I, I don't think I'm very courageous. And I said, why? She's like, because I feel she nervous. She used that word? Yeah, she's like, because I feel nervous. And I said... I told my daughter, I said, courage is not not being scared. I said, if you're not scared, then you don't need to courage. You don't need courage to go up there. That's easy. I said, courage is when you're scared and you do it anyway. And you should have seen the look on her face. She was just like, I could I could see the little fire come up inside of her, you know? Yep. And she was like, hmm. And then right before she went up on stage, because you know, my my kids they're in that generation where, you know, YouTube is like that's like NBC when we were kids or, or CBS or whatever. It's a big network. And so right before she gets on stage, you know, I, I or goes back to, you know, get ready or whatever, I kind of grab her by the shoulders and I whisper in her ear. And I said, don't forget this. I said, you're my daughter. I said, you know, I get scared. I get nervous when I make videos on YouTube because she always loves talking about how I'm on YouTube. Mm-hmm. I said, but I do it anyway, just like you're about to do it. And she's fucking walked up there and I, she like had her fist clenched <laughs> so face great. Like right. a little champion yeah. so proud face it so proud so so nice so that's, exciting that's uh, really cool that's fun, yeah man. yeah it's really fun man <laughs> when you watch your kids do something like that and but i think it's important that you you to tell your kids that because i didn't understand this when I, until i got a, a little older i thought being courageous meant having no fear mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying like oh i have no fear therefore i'm courageous and I wish somebody explained to me like no 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 it's when you scare when you're scared and you do it anyway yeah because that would have ch- it would have changed my relationship oh of course with yeah. fear that's stuff that we put I mean personally I put it together over years of that feeling right and then not doing it like I think it takes like a, a normal person who doesn't get commu- who doesn't have a father who communicates at an early age like you know I'm sure there was many things in my life that I was afraid of that I didn't do because I was afraid of yeah. and I think over it it took years and years of the times when you were afraid but you still did it anyways and then the feeling afterwards, you have to do that a few times before you start to connect that like, yeah. oh shit, wait a second. Every time I'm scared and I do it anyways, holy shit, that's better than any feeling. That's better oh, That's yeah. better than just doing something. I had the same something. conversation with my, my oldest. He got elected to be the big bad wolf of, of this play that like, so it was more than just for his own class. Like he actually had to perform this in front of like a couple grades above his. So it was like his peers that were, you know, older kids. And so he was like totally cool with it. And like, it's like a lead role, you know, he's like a bunch of lines and everything and he's been practicing. And, 
um, it got down to the day where of where it was like, okay, it's the day of. I'm making him breakfast. We're all kind of talking about it, hyping him up a little bit, and he was just like, just like ghost white, you know, <laughs> <laughs> ghost white. Like it was just like I, I don't know. Like he he literally was having like a little mini panic attack. Like he was like, I don't know if I want to go to school today, Dad. You know, oh, and all this. No. And like it, he was like, it just hit him like all of a sudden, like oh, this is like real. Like I'm gonna have to like perform. Yeah, my heart just sinks kids. sinks for that right away too. And it's not even my child, you know. What I'm saying yeah. just the empathy for the kid going through that because at that age it's different. Like oh, he I can talk a big a game right now at fucking you know 36 years old and shit like that because you've got a bunch of reps under your belt. But when you're that age, dude, yeah, that's f- gotta that's gotta seem huge. The first time he ever had stepped out in front of like his peers and done anything, you know, like he's not. Yeah. So, I mean, just talking to him and like same, same exact scenario where we're just talking about like facing your fears and um, that, you know, as you go through that, that's what builds bravery. That's what builds courage. Um, and you actually learn that it's not, it's not as bad once you start getting into it. Right. Like it's, it's all about just getting there and then performing mm-hmm. and, and, and going through that process. And, you know, and I told him how I get scared all the time. I do things I'm uncomfortable with constantly and uh, just what it's helped to build my character and help me in life, you know, and and so he just like finally, I guess, <laughs> my wife thankfully was able to kind of take him to school and and watch it, and I wasn't able to watch it because I had to go to work, but uh, I guess you know he went up there and was just like real nervous, and then just after the first line, it was like he was on fire. After oh really? That. But yeah, it took it. <laughs> he, he still wanted to back out like right before it started. So wow. I got out of him. I that. got so emotional. I, yeah. I was watching her do the thing, and I knew that she was nervous going into it. And that I mean, remember this. This is. I mean, this is. Consider this. Second grade. She's a girl, and you know, girls typically don't. You know, being humorous or being funny, it's not as acceptable. I would say for little girls to make funny faces or make right. jokes. That's something that boys, you know, stereotypically tend to do, but it's actually kind of true. So she's up there, she's making fun of herself. She's in second grade. She's not doing an act like anybody else. And I knew she was scared and then she did it. And I'm watching this and I'm like, I'm going to fucking cry right in this audience oh, yeah. right now. <laughs> but you know, it, it, it boils down and this took me so long to learn. And I wish I knew this as a kid, yeah. you know, fearing fear or being afraid of being nervous is worse than being nervous or being or having the fear of doing something. Yeah, it's worse. It's when you you're torturing yourself. Yeah, you're 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 so afraid. You want to avoid the feeling of of nerves and anxiety so bad because it's it's, it's something you hate so much or you create that relationship with it mm-hmm. that you hate it so much that adds like fifty trillion layers to it because when you stop hating fear and instead ex- expect it, yeah, like think about that. Like, okay, I know I'm going to go speak in front of these people. And I'm going to be fucking terrified and expect it. Like that's just going to happen. Changes a lot. All of a sudden you're like, whoa, this is a different, it's a different perception of the same feeling. It doesn't. Oh yeah. We talked about it being exciting and I just kept trying to emphasize the fact that it's like very exciting for you to do this. And this is, you know, something that you're going to enjoy completely, but what feels like complete fear and the unknown you know, you can you can literally start to address it as like this is just an exciting, fun thing I get to do instead. Yeah. Do you oh. guys remember moments in your life, like growing up, where you started to kind of overcome that feeling? Because I'm sure all of us, uh, when we were younger, so many reps to get to that place. Like, do you do you remember being terrified before having to speak or do things like that? And and at all what points time, did you dude. start to feel yourself overcome that? Oh like, yeah, the first the first um, all staff meeting that I conducted as a uh, tr- uh, fitness manager. So I was 18 years old, so I'm a kid. I have no experience doing any of this stuff. And then I you know, I was a trainer for four years and then now I'm doing a, a meeting, an all staff meeting, because now I'm, a, I'm the manager of the fitness department. And I remember knowing, I, was, I knew I was gonna do it, right? And I got really nervous, but it, my relationship with, my, with nerves for that was different and I didn't identify this till much later. And the reason why it was different was because I felt like I had a team that needed to depend on me. So when once I realized that, oh, these people depend on me, I was still nervous, but I had a different relationship with that. Like, I need to do this for my team. And I stood up on a desk and I gave this meeting and it was very, very different. And when I feel, and I didn't put that together till much later on. It actually happened with us here at Mind Pump a while ago. We had the I don't remember what we did. We did a tr- the big seminar, a trainer seminar, and I was supposed to open it. And 
I was kind of nervous. And then I don't remember who it was. I don't think it was, I don't know if it was Adam or Justin. When you said, Hey Sal, listen, we're just going to, you know, follow your lead. And I don't know what it is that, that I knew like, Oh fuck, my team's depending on me. And that created, it creates a different relationship with the same feeling. And so really it's, it's re- and I'm putting this together now. I'm almost, you know, I'm 39 years old, right? Yeah. It's all about your, re- you, like, am I afraid of being afraid? Or do I expect it, understand it, and then and then I'm okay with it? You know what yeah. I'm saying? Changes absolutely everything. Yeah, you know? it's interesting because I've gone through different uh, types of, of performing fear. And, and, you know, whether it's from sports or from music. And um, I remember at a young age, it was music. It was performing a a piece on the piano that I had memorized and uh, uh, I think it was Moonlight Sonata. And I still, to this day, that's like one of the only songs I can, I know how to play (laughs) because I took it so seriously. (laughs) And I like, you see my mom has a video. This is so fucking, it's hilarious. I was like probably nine, nine years old, I would say maybe eight or nine. Um, And um, I'm in front of like this whole, um, like it was, it was in a church, but it was like all of the seats were filled. It was like this big display cause they would start with the kids and then it'd go into like, you know, the more accomplished, uh, you know, musicians. And like, there was uh, just a, so many people, I thought it was just going to be in front of like the kids and the parents like, cool. But no, it became this big, huge, like ordeal. And so I'm up there, I was just sweat bullets and the first few notes went just sour <laughs> And I stopped completely and I, and I looked over, you know, at, at my parents and I just, I, I had like a, like anxiety. I just like, I was, I froze and I, I couldn't, I couldn't like muster it up again. And then the teacher came up and kind of like, you know, put her hand on my shoulder and was like, no, you can do this. You know, like it's like, you know, the skills, like just relax. Nobody's here, blah, blah, blah. Like trying to give me this pep talk. And then finally, like, I just, I started playing again and then, I just got into this weird zone where I'm just like feeling it and then and then I'm like really feeling it to where like the music I'm like rocking with it and everything. Oh, <laughs> it was so funny, dude. If you watch the video, I just get through the whole thing. Did you and saw the nailed video? It, nailed it. And then I'm like at the end, I'm like I, I play to where I like soften the notes at the end and I'm like crouching down real low with it. You know, I'm just like nee, nee. And then <laughs> after I was done, everybody's just like, Yeah. You know, like like burst in. in you in couldn't applause. have planned it better. Like you made it yeah. dramatic on purpose. So dramatic, everybody was on pins and needles because I was like so fucking scared. Oh man, uh, terrified. You had, do you still have that video? Yeah, I'll have to get it for my mom. Man. Oh, she dude, you're gonna have, you're gonna have yeah. to bring that. I actually would love to see pictures of everybody when we were kids. I know. I would love. To. Would By fun. the way, Adam, I got a bone to pick with you. Okay, uh, you talk about me. how ugly we were in high school all the time. I was uh, uh, unattractive. Your, I don't know who it was. Was it your sister or someone posted a picture of your high school yearbook? Oh, dude, he looks like JT. You're a fucking handsome ass kid, bro. Tips so, no, you wait, were wait, a, wait, wait, a poontang magnet. Let me, <laughs> let me defend myself. That's a picture day. You know what I'm saying? We're wearing makeup. We have a suit. Probably the first suit I ever put on, right? Because I didn't wear a suit before that, right? So No, I'm, I know genetics uh, and bone structure and facial features. You were a handsome I fellow. I had swag, dude. I had swag is you what I did. You could feel the swag through I, the picture? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you see, I had swag, dude. I, I just, think hella people on the forum, too, they're like, wait a minute, I well, you were track. Notice, no. notice, You're notice. Fucking handsome. Yeah, remember, it's a headshot too, right? And I'm closing my mouth. If I actually smiled and showed my teeth, my two front teeth are completely crooked. I mean, completely turned in. And let's be honest: when you're a kid and you have some like something like oh, that, oh yeah, you make it. Yeah, it's th- a it's, lot yeah. bigger deal than it yeah, is. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, so th- I mean, I had that, and then you can't tell because I'm in a tuxedo, but I'm a buck thirty five wet. You know, what I'm saying at six foot, so I'm you know teased for being bur- shredded. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, shredded to the ribs. Like you can see my <laughs> you can see my ribs more than you can see abs. Right. So that's like, damn. Look at those obliques. Right. And then I oh, and I drove I drove the hand me down 1987 brown Toyota Camry with busted out lights and smell like mildew because my parents left the window down the year before right so mm. i mean i definitely was not uh and i i know people put that on the forum like yeah, I, I know i know i'm just i don't you. talk about being ha- i didn't say i was ugly like <laughs> fuck dude like you know or maybe i said that that's me being humble a little bit you know what i'm saying i know how i dated the hottest girl in school you know what i'm saying like you yeah, can't be like doesn't have by accident yeah, yeah. I, and but what I, the message that i always try to give to people about that was that it was it wasn't that it was because was, it wasn't a popular kid for 
the normal popular things, right? I didn't have a lot of uh, friends because I had a nice car. Like sure. Those because I had a pretty smile because I was a starting quarterback. Like I played sports, sports, but I worked my ass off and I got you know okay playing time. I didn't start on any of the teams that I played. I was, but I busted my ass. I was the same way in school. I wasn't super brilliant, but I busted my ass all the time and I had crooked teeth and I was skinny and so I didn't have a lot of things like that were in your favor as a kid. You know in, what's in funny school. though when you when you when you when you start to realize is that your perception of yourself because I'm the same way and I'm, you know your perception of yourself is probably way worse than you know what I'm saying like I thought I was so skinny so painfully whatever but if I look at old picture of myself yeah I'm a skinny kid but it's not like if I was walking down the street if I'd see this kid I'd be like oh my god yeah. somebody call a doctor somebody feed this kid yeah I, I would be like oh it's a normal skinny skinny kid but I had a couple comments and because I identified with it 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 was so much worse. Oh, of course. You know? I mean, you and you, it takes years for you. I mean, for most people, I feel like, and some people never get beyond that. I mean, I, I put that s- stuff together later on in life. You know, like how, when yeah. I talk about, you know, my character as a, a young man, it's that's just me being an older guy reflecting back on it. Like I wasn't that fucking self aware back then. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I was a mm-hmm. fucking kid. I'm just running around trying to be cool. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like I, I just want to be accepted at that at that age. I, I just want to get a, have friends. I want to play sports. I want to have a girlfriend. I want to be fucking normal. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Like, and I already know that I'm at a disadvantage because I don't have a lot of the things that all these other kids have. And so I had to make up with that with my personality. I was mm-hmm. friendly with everybody. I was outgoing. I was, I was just a, I was the life of the party wherever I was as a kid. So you know, talking about nervous moments, I was trying to rack my brain of times where I was really nervous like that. And I've I, there's been more moments in the podcasting that I have felt that way than anything else, which is why I love it though. Oh, for sure. Same because here. I yeah, have yeah. a, I have just this different relationship with these things. And one of those is that, uh, and I don't know where I connected this, but the, and it's probably my, I should give my mom some love and credit. Cause I know I, I beat her up on the show sometimes is that, you know, she, one of the things that she, she established really good morals and values in us at a very young age. And I think the radical honesty and truth thing uh, speaks volumes to being able to get through a lot of the stuff. And it, what I mean by that is when you get really nervous, sometimes I think it's because you're not being 100% honest. I think it's because you're trying to be a certain way for everybody else. And so mm-hmm. part of that is you, because you have to kind of fake it, it gets really fucking scary. And mm-hmm. something I learned a long time ago was the the more I was just fucking real, like mm-hmm. say what's on my mind. You know what? It's going to rub somebody the wrong way. It's going to come out. Words are going to be made up sometimes. It's not going to flow perfect, yeah. but I'm speaking the truth and having that feeling of like, and that integrity of being able to do that, I, it carried me a long way at a very early age. Mm-hmm. And I think that was installed in me from my mother and the values that she built in me later on. And then now I've seen it expressed. And now I thrive in those environments. I love to be, challenge like that i love that if i get nervous and scared because what what it shows me is now i have something new to focus on and better mm-hmm. and improve you know mm-hmm. so the podcast is probably the most that what what like any moments in particular just the very first day really mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying like because every day after that to me was it, that was the moment that switch turns on for me once i put my mind to something that i want to improve upon it or i want to get better whatever mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying like once i make that switch i'm committed um, every day was fun for me, you yeah. know, like the first one was a little bit of nerves. Like, what are we doing? What are we saying? Like, who's going to be listening to this? Like, so there was a little bit of those nerves, but I really didn't get that much. You I know? think it's cool. Cause we're all, we, we're all nervous about different things about what we do. And we're all super confident about different things. So they tend to complement each other. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? That's been one of the like cra- podcasting for me. Never. I've never been, never been for me. It's like talking on a microphone. You're kidding me. Might as well ask, ask me to breathe. But you know, if you want me to, if I'm going to talk to a group of influencers, and in, which I've done before in the past, and I can do it, but I always get nervous beforehand when I'm doing like a crowd. I love whatever. that. I always get yes, yeah, yeah, and you yeah. enjoy doing that. Yeah, I love, I love that. I do better with that because here, this, and this is probably why I was so nervous with the podcast is because I know I don't articulate myself beautifully all the time. You know, I'm not, I don't have the silver tongue for sure out of the three of us. And so I think my, my mind is analyzing that the whole time going like, Mm. God, I fucking sound so stupid, but people don't really know inside everything about me inside because I can't articulate it really well. And so I think that's what I struggled with the beginning. Well, when you're in person with me, like, and you, you meet me, I can connect with somebody. I can connect with anybody Mm. really fast too, 
because because you get to when you see that and I feel like when I meet other people that have that that honesty piece I feel it right away yeah like I just feel it which is also why we all connected mm-hmm. like I mean that was one of the things that connects us is you can just you can feel like there's and we talk about this all the time every time we have a guest you know off mic we all are analyze the fuck out of them everybody sits down what do you think and we argue <laughs> back and forth you know what I'm saying like but I could just we have files well, on all of those happen <laughs> no it does because that's just it's I don't know for me I think it's it's uh, human nature right of I course think everybody, it's, everybody does it right and you're just trying to see who's and really what makes somebody somebody who we stay connected with or somebody that we we rep as a friend is is the truth piece is that they're just honest and being real with themselves more importantly yeah. than anything else and you know and I, I think there's relationships that people probably wouldn't even think that we are really really close to that we're close to because maybe they're different the way they run their business or things like that. And so people think they're so different than we are, but then what we, we, I, you know, identify with and what we connect with is their, their real. It's that character. Yeah. Real character. Look, Ben Greenfield couldn't be more different than, than us. I mean, there's some elements that are similar, but he's also, he's a very different individual from us, but we love him. We loved him from like this first or second time we met him because he's, He's got good character. He's kind of a real solid, you know, kind of individual. Yeah. And however different he is, that's the part that I that I think we're all kind of. Drawn no, he's to. a great example. Yeah. That's another. That's a great example of somebody who. It, it, there's no way, probably, as a high school kid, that Ben and I would have been connected oh. and been friends. Mm-hmm. Just yeah. different. And I was friends with a lot of different people, but Ben's just we were into different things. We're not alike mm-hmm. in a, a lot of ways. But the thing that we connect in is, I think he's very comfortable with who he is. Yeah, I think. A lot of times when people are living life as their true self, it may seem odd, you know, to everybody. Like, like, like that's kooky. Or that's, that's right. That's weird. Yep. Like, what was he like? And so I think that I've always been attracted to people like that that sort of stand out of the herd and, you know, are just authentically living their life, you know, the way they want to. And it's it's such an attractive quality. You know, and a lot of times you'll meet like really weird people and you can appreciate it, but it's like, ah, I'll stay over here, you know, but then sometimes you're like, oh, wow, like I want to be close with this Well, there's, a, there's there's an extreme version of that and then the fake version of that That's too. Right. That's right. You know, there's, there, there's, yeah, exactly. Putting on a fake sort of facade. Like, yeah, that, yeah. Like, trying, look at me, I'm weird. Yeah. yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And so I think some Gaining people, attention. some people would think that about Ben when you, outside looking in, but when you really sure. get to know who no, he is. He's fucking real, dude. No, no. He's, he's literally like that. Well, yeah. that's, <laughs> I remember, I remember the very first time I'd seen his stuff before we met and I remember thinking like, oh, this guy fucking just, Peddling everything and making money <laughs> off all this pseudoscience and shit. Perching on his couch I like didn't, a bird. Yeah, I didn't think I was going to yeah. like him. But then, you know, what I realized was, man, if there was going to be a motherfucker that took all these things and tried these things and like went back and measured it, yeah. this is the human being I would want yeah. doing that. That's your that. guy you want testing right. your if product. I, right. Yeah. That is the guy I want because I know he is measuring all aspects of his life and he is very meticulous and careful about everything. Yeah. So I know when he adds something to his regimen or takes it away, like the the effects and the things that I hear, I want to hear his yeah. perspective probably more than anybody else's. So yeah. that's- and I can always, for me at least, I don't know how, how accurate this is, but it seems pretty accurate for me. I can almost always tell somebody's character if they're that kind of a person by the way they are with their kids. And that's what mm-hmm. did it with Ben. Mm-hmm. We hung out with him that first time and we're all kind of like, well, I don't know, maybe, you know, he seems pretty cool. I don't know. And then I saw him with his boys and I was like, oh yeah, this dude's, he's he's legit, he's genuine. And there's been a couple experiences like that where, where we've met people and then we've seen them with their kids. And I don't know, I can just always see that, like, especially the way a man is with his children, because it doesn't seem to be a second nature sometimes. You know whether or not they ignore their kids, or they're super attentive, or you know how they how they are with their kids, if they treat them, how they hold them, if they kiss them, if they hug them, whatever. And when I see that, I can see like, oh, this is a real. Because I've seen a lot of pe- people, parents, who posture around other people when they're around their kids, hmm. so they're trying to act like they're you know real good parents, and right. you know. But you can kind of tell like, oh, that's not coming from their heart. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I can usually. That's kind of like my litmus test, you know, for something like what, that. What you guys? What do you, what's the split? You guys think of like people that are fake and and all for the show type of deal for the attention and everything like that whether it be for business or personal and selfish whatever and then the split that is like fucking 100 percent genuine who they are i don't know what the split is it's it's not a ton of people that seem to be very no. genuine yeah it's not a ton but there's there's definitely people that are very real i think yeah most people we've met we we tend to just uh, you know bring them in 
Like if we know for sure they're an authentic, real. Well, we cool try person, our best to only. We, we fuck try with to that. bring them in, or at least help and contribute them in their process in some fashion. Because it's like it is. It's such a rare thing these days to find. Like you don't find a lot of people like that. that no, it's it's you know everybody's psycho- posturing. Psychologists explain uh, explain being like everybody else or blending in. It's it's a it's a safety mechanism. We evolved to be safe. When you see a bunch of animals in a herd. Which one is the one that's going to get killed and hunted by a lion? It's not the one that's in the group. No, it's the it's one that's the ones on the fringe. It's the one standing outside. You know, mm-hmm. when when all of us are the same level, nobody's neck is sticking is sticking out. Nobody's putting themselves out there to be attacked or to be ridiculed or whatever. And so it's mm-hmm. safe. It is very safe to go with the crowd, and it's very yeah. powerful. It's an extremely powerful motivator that intrinsic that we have that we're born with, and it's very hard to. To break now, this I'm not saying that it's necessarily a bad thing always to kind of blend in or whatever. Societies have to organize themselves and people have to work together. Do you think that's that's already born into built into us? It is genetic. Mm-hmm. It is. It's evolutionary. Because so then, off that, do you believe then that leaders are born or are they developed? I think uh, both. Hmm. I think both. I think leaders. I think there's there's probably a genetic like everything, right? There's probably a genetic component because there's something about them too that I believe that. They're outlier. Like there's certain levels of like leaders. It's just like you're yeah. not the guy who wants to be in the pack with her or girl, and you've never been since day one. It's like, and I feel like there's there's those people. Then I feel there's people who learn the skills of a natural leader, and they and they can develop that, and they can lead themselves too. But there's some people that just seem like they have that. And yeah. they've always had Yeah, that. I don't know. I, I don't know what the split is, but every time they do studies on behaviors, it's always it's typically a nature and nurture you know it's usually mm-hmm. genetics involved and there's another component and it's the right mix of the two that creates right. a type of behavior for example you know let's say you have somebody who's like a super successful leader uh you know great character but they grew up in a very very tough situation the kind of situations that typically break people that or that create criminals or create you know people that are stuck in the in the poverty cycle well maybe that tough life was the right mix with their particular genetic makeup, and that's what produced a winner. And maybe if that person grew up in a posh environment where everything was provided to them and they had all the support and all the stuff that you're supposed to have, maybe that would have made them more lazy, more complacent, or right. not that kind of an individual. So it's 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 hard to say what produces what because I feel like there's enough extremely successful people that I'm aware of who, who grew up in very difficult situations, and statistically speaking, difficult situations don't typically result in success. They typically, look, if you take a bunch of kids and you put them in a household that's poverty, maybe abuse, maybe single parent, like these are all statistics, right? Um, the odds are that more of them will do worse than than, than not, right? But every once in a while, you get the right mix, and, and it's not, I don't know, like, who would I be if I grew up in a different situation? Who would you guys be? It's it's a, I think it's a very difficult thing to study because when you're looking at outliers, how do you study the outliers? They're they're already outliers. You know what I'm saying? They're already not the average. I mean, you can look at the averages, but when you look outside the averages, it's it's kind of. I mean, Elon Musk definitely there was some some you know life things that made him the way he is, but there's he's also definitely just a different human being right you know so how do you study that i don't think you can i don't don't really think you can that's what i mean i feel like and and it's an example of like brilliance like that like i'm sure you could back that all the way up to childhood dude Mm -hmm. like i'm sure if you and i I haven't watched too many documentaries on them and that's dove that deep into them but i would assume that there were signs of that early early on in his life before he even got to the point where he was this maniac, you dude. Know? So, 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 check this out. This is so. This kind of brings me to an, uh, uh, an interesting topic. So, uh, yesterday I did a post on uh, gender pay gap, and I talk about the economics and why it's likely, highly likely, it's not uh, based on sexism, but rather other factors like the time decisions that men and women tend to make, and all these other things. And I got a lot of positive feedback, by the way, from. All women, which tripped me out. I thought I was going to piss people off. Yeah, wow. But I got something like 50 DMs from women who are like, thank you. I'm sick and tired of being told I'm a victim and all this other stuff. And I was like, whoa, this is, I did not expect this. So it was, it was pretty cool. That's cool. But uh, I did get in a debate with, uh, with, with a couple individuals or discussion. And, uh, you know, it, we went down that rabbit hole. Any really smart people, like doctors or anything like that? Yeah, one of them was really smart. So we had this discussion and, uh, 
you know, one thing that I said that really made this individual upset in this discussion was I highlighted how, and because we were talking about the the different choices that men and women uh, tend to make. And I was explaining, look, if you look at the middle of the pack with humans, we're all pretty fucking similar. Like there's like one, you know, one standard deviation difference between men and women in certain parameters, which is not much when you're looking at the middle. Like if you, if you took a bunch of women and a bunch of men and you rated them on something like empathy, which they can test, right? Uh, men will typically rank one standard deviation below women, which mm-hmm. in the middle isn't that big of a difference. In, in, in speaking of empathy, ma- male humans are incredible, uh, have incredible parental, um, you know, uh, be, uh, behaviors and and instincts much more than most other mammals. Like male humans are really good parents compared to other male mammals, which tend to be terrible parents and usually just protect and get food and then if the child gets in the way they'll eat them (laughs) that's just that's a that's a real statistic but we tend to be pretty good with kids including other kids which again mammals male mammals with other children are terrible and and male humans are pretty good but nonetheless we do rank lower than women in those kinds of categories in the middle doesn't mean a whole lot we're all kind of very very similar but if we go to the ends of the spectrum if we picked you know, 100 of the most empathetic humans on earth, all of them would be women, all of them. Because at the extreme end, you have all these extreme levels of empathy or whatever, which women tend to score highest in. And so you see this in all these other things. And so we were having this just this particular discussion. Well, actually, it would be just like comparing the, the top 100 hunters. There would be, it would be more Something likely like to be men right. just for that, even though there's tons of women that are badass at hunting. That's my, yeah, exactly. I, I mean, those standard deviation differences are small in the middle, but at the ends, they start to get real big. Just like if you took two parallel lines and you separated them by a, a you know a, a tenth of a degree, you, you keep traveling you know down those lines and they separate quite a bit at the ends. And so we were talking about this and I said, look, I said, you know, here's an interesting statistic. She didn't like this. I said, when you look at uh, humans, most of us are, are somewhere in the middle in terms of, you know, uh, average, uh, you know, uh, violence or aggression or brilliance or whatever, whatever you want to call it. We're all kind of similar. But when you go on the ends, there's more men on the extremes than there are women. For example, if you look at uh, criminality and aggressiveness and violence, men and women, women are about one standard deviation less violent than men are. In the middle, that doesn't mean much. You take a bunch of average people and most of them are not going to be violent. Most of them are not going to want to hurt people and all that stuff. But if you go on the extreme end of the most violent, most, uh, you know, uh, the biggest criminals, whatever, it's all men. And this is why prisons are filled with men and there's hardly as many women in comparison. But if you go on the other end of the extreme, and she didn't like this part, you go on the other end of the extreme and you look at achievers, uh, you know, people who who can be considered, uh, you know, brilliant or whatever. You see, also more men, and she didn't like that part. And in in, but it's evolutionary speaking, it makes sense because if you have a society where there are very very few men and a lot of women, that society can survive. Technically, it could totally survive. You could have, you know, ten men and a hundred women, and you're going to make a lot of babies. Flip it would never work. If you had a lot of men and a little bit of women, society collapses. And so what what evolution has basically done is it's rolled the dice more with men than with women because we're disposable. Because it's okay for it to to roll the dice a little more. So you're going to see more extremes with men in in all different kinds of uh, of cases. And that was just one example of how, you know, differences between men and women can account for when you look at broadly, you see differences in things. And what do you like, think that is? It's it's men are trying all these different things so they can reproduce, and so that's what maybe right. s- set us off in different ways. Like, I'm going to work really hard, and maybe that's going to get some ass. Well, you know, here, that, didn't, that didn't work well, out. Like, well, I'm going to get really strong, and that's going to go gonna after be, the saber-toothed tiger we're, today. Right. We're disposable. We're far more disposable than than women are. I mean, uh, you know, we you can kill off half the men in America right now, and America will, will survive. You kill off half the women, and, and society will, will collapse. You don't have enough people to pick, to carry, you know, carry children. So it's just 
it's just an, it's just evolutionary. I thought right. we covered the gender pay gap thing already, didn't we? Yeah, do, we did talked we, about did it. Did we do it with yeah. Kibby? You should you should just uh, you of course you, you know what you love that stuff, bro. Yeah, you yeah. love that yeah. stuff that you even waste well, your time going back and forth. On it. Like I'm at the point now where yeah. someone asks a question that I know we addressed in detail. Like here's the fucking episode, or go download the app <laughs> and search it. No, search you it. know what it is. I realize about myself. I like talking about controversial shit. Yeah, that's it's what get, it is. As long as it's controversial, I get excited. If it's yeah. like. Oh, that's a topic. Well, because they'll actually question. respond because you'll put bait out there and you're realizing, you know, it's like, oh, it's not it's not controversial enough, right, for them to respond. Yeah, I just, I really yeah. enjoy that. Speaking of controversial, you know how we did the episode where we talked about um, Kanye's song about Trump or whatever? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, we made the speculation that there seems to be a cultural shift. And I was making this big point that, uh, you know, for a long time now, and again, I want to be clear, I have to say this every fucking episode, we're not, you know, I can speak for myself, but I know you guys too. We're not pro Trump or anti Trump or pro Democrat or pro Republican. Nope. We're much more independent in the sense that we pretend to be down the little, the middle, pro freedom, pro liberty, which means, you know, sometimes we agree with. I go liberalism. policy by policy. Yeah. So, so we were talking about this, and I said something like, you know, minorities for a long time, the the liberal party, the Democrats have taken it, uh, have taken for granted that minorities are just going to vote for them for a little while. And we talked about the history of the Democrat Party and how they used to actually be pro-segregation, pro-slavery, all these different things. And so on the for- on our forum, there was a little bit of a debate and somebody's like, no, nah, it's bullshit. Re- you know, uh, minorities hate Trump. And I'm like, no, man. I said, I can sense a cultural shift that's starting to happen. <laughs> and it's pretty crazy. And Kanye is an example of that. Boom, a fucking Reuters poll comes out. This poll just was done. Which you didn't even have to send or read to me because once I knew he he oh, did yeah. anything with Kanye, it was game over, Bro, dude. Course, Black yeah. male approval for Trump doubled. 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 It, like after a day. Yes. Right? It yeah. was at 11%. Now it's at 22%, which yeah. is, there's a weird- I knew that was going to happen. There's yeah. a weird, crazy shift that's happening in yeah. the political sphere that is interesting to me. Yeah. <laughs> Well, he has a lot of weight, man. You know, like him him voicing that like was, I mean, that's a big deal. It is, but it's also, it's weird because Trump, as much as he's, I don't, I really don't like him in many, many different ways, but he has this appeal with a lot of different people. And I don't, I think it's just, it's got to be because he's, he's, and who knows, he may be the fakest motherfucker in the world, right. but he comes across as being not fake in comparison to other politicians yeah. because there's no polish. Yeah. yeah. You know, because you always expect a politician to smile and say the right thing and to answer a question with like politically correct. And then you got Trump who's like, you know, now we'll nuke him or, you yeah. know, calling people yeah. rocket man or whatever. <laughs> and you're like, what? This is why you can't get into sports, dude. Because you got, wait, this is sports for nerds. Yeah, is, is, politics mm-hmm. is fucking sports for nerds. That's all it is to me. <laughs> yeah. It really is. It's the same goddamn thing. But I mean, I think there's that. I think there's that level of intelligence in sports too. Just average people don't dive in deep enough yeah. to learn that. That's well, why I think you would love it. Yeah. No. I got. I only get into politics because, and I'm not super polit- political in the sense I follow all the politicians. I just, you know, I got into legislation and economics because once I realized, here's the realization I had a while ago. When I real, there was two things that I realized that really I had trouble sleeping the first time I thought of this. In fact, I, I wrote about it today on my uh, Insta story. When I I read an article that we all pay taxes, right? And we all have to pay taxes. If you don't pay taxes, you'll get fined. They'll take your property, and you keep not paying them, and eventually they'll throw you in jail. We all know this, you know. But we all take it for we all kind of like accept it because we're born into it. And I remember reading this article where this guy wrote and he says, you know, up in the average American up until about. April 22nd, that's they did the math, is working for the government. And I thought about that. I'm like, holy fuck. The first quarter of the year, every hour that I'm working is not for me. It's for the government, which is fine if that's what you want to do. But what if you don't? What if you don't want to do it? And I kept thinking about that. And I'm like, oh, shit. What is the definition of this? Working for someone else because you're afraid of being hurt or thrown into a cage. In other words, by threat of violence. It sounds like the mafia to well, me. It sounds like slavery. Yeah. That's actually the literal definition of being a slave. So when I, I thought of that, I was like, that's kind of crazy and I don't have a choice. And then I thought about this. I said, wait a minute. Um, I can't do anything I want to my own self. So, you know, think about that for a second. Like, what if I wanted to alter my, my mind, my state of mind? What if I wanted to take a drug for my body? What if I wanted, and I'm an adult, right? What if I wanted to have someone pay me for sex? 
it's my body, right? I can't do that. In fact, if I do that and I get caught, they will throw me into a cage or find me or whatever. But the point is this, I don't own my body. So I'm like, holy shit, I'm a, a, I'm, I'm forced to work for someone else. I have no choice in it, whether I want to or not, I have no choice. And I can't do to myself. And I'm not talking about hurting anybody else. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about my own self. Like I'm in my body, I own it. I can't do anything I want to myself. When I realized those two things, man, I lost sleep. I remember thinking like, this is fucking crazy. It's a situation that you're born into and then you don't realize like, so then I got into politics because I said, oh, okay, this has a major impact on me in a real way. I just didn't understand it. And so then I started becoming interested in, in that whole process because I thought to myself, I'm not a violent person. I'm not going to do all. I just said, okay, how can I do this in a, in, within the system to change things? And I said, I better understand this stuff. I better start learning it. Mm. And that's, that's what got me into it. So sports, as fascinating as they are, like – you know, if the if the Warriors lose or win, it's not going to force me to do something. It doesn't own me. It's not any of that stuff. And that's – but I can definitely be fascinated by sports. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, no. And that's how I feel about politics. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm serious. So that's how – I mean, like, I'll do what the fuck I want anyway. How do, yeah, how do I – exactly. Yeah. <laughs> how how do I, I – you. How do I – I mean, when we talk about it off air, I mean, that's how I talk about it. Like, I am impressed with the maneuvers that I see being made, and I and I love shows like House of Cards. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm into all that stuff, so I, I like that part of it. But that's – again, I just kind of have this – it's like sports for nerds. Yeah. I mean, it's like all these guys are all making all these decisions and moves and what gets put out in the media. And like, we all sit back here and we argue and fight with each other and try and debate these points. It's just like, at the end of the day, dude, they're up there like puppet masters, man. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's dude. Totally. They're just spinning wheels and nothing's getting accomplished. And that's why you like to see this whole process get disrupted because it's just like, wow, and it even was if, such a gamified thing. Even if there is, I mean, because it's not like, I mean, we're still evolving as a society. I mean, there's a lot of things we're going yeah. backwards into, but I mean, we're, we're, so it's not like it's all for waste. I don't think that. I think that, but I definitely think that there's a lot of greed involved. I think that uh, anybody that, uh, and power, that gets that much money and power, I think it's it's tough to not try and play God. You know, I think that any any man or woman in that position would be tempted to to do that. And if in our society, the way we are run, nobody has more an opportunity to play God than the the president and the you know the government. Man, I mean, they have the most power over us as a society. And you know, to think that they wouldn't want to play with that power, fuck. Yeah, you know what it is. Yeah. It's, it's I haven't met a man or woman that wouldn't want. Well, here's what it is in, in the the election. Corrupts, absolutely, the election of Trump. Uh, I I was happy with it in one respect, not because he got elected. I didn't vote for him, and for the record, I didn't vote for Hillary either. But uh, here's what made me happy about it: not a single. I mean, I can't say not a single. Almost nobody from either side wanted Trump to win. Republicans mm. hated him, and of course, the Democrats hated him. So here's this guy that nobody nobody wants him to win. Every poll that was done showed him having zero chance of winning. So he was super underdog. If you had put money on Trump in Vegas, by the way, the Vegas odds are the best predictors of who's going to be president. And the Vegas odds, I don't remember what they were exactly, but if you put money on Trump, you would have won a lot of money because it was like Hillary for sure is going to win this. Yeah. And then he won. And, and, and I was happy about that, not because he won. <laughs> Vegas bets on it. Not because he won. I was happy because uh, it, it made me – feel better like oh wait a minute it's not maybe it's not rigged like i thought it was right. because nobody wanted him to win and yet he still did so i don't think the voting system yeah. is rigged necessarily but here's what i do think i think that they they figured out how to divide everybody that's number uh, rule number one i don't think the voting system is rigged at all i've never yeah. thought I, I i think less of that than they're still the puppet masters with the way they put it media yep. and information yep. and yep. you get to hear what they want you to hear and that's why I, I mean, I remember when we, we just recently we got in that little debate about stuff. It's like anytime a move happens, and anyone, and if I'm in a conversation where we get into some sort of a political debate, and somebody starts saying, "Oh, well, Trump just did this, or Hillary just did this, or Clinton just did this," and they say some shit like that, it's like, well, really though? I mean, do you you have no idea? That's what they want you to know. <laughs> you know, what I'm saying you're not in all the meetings. You have no idea what's coming next. You have like, and so but we're over here fucking fighting back and forth. And I think nine times out of ten. That's what they want in the first place. Some yeah. topic that we can all debate oh, over dude. while the real shit's happening behind closed doors. Look, I'll tell you what. Come on. I'll tell you what. If Come you want on. to prove that point, is the easiest way you can do it. 
anytime we go to war or bomb another country, p- go backwards and look at the series of events and things that we've yeah. heard in the media and heard them say in order to get uh, popular support because right. the U.S. government rarely goes in and uh, launches an attack without knowing that they have at least a decent amount of American support because they learned that lesson in Vietnam. Vietnam created a crazy uh, you know, counterculture movement. And part of that was because we had a draft, so we have people who are going to war who don't want to go to war. Uh, but the other part of it was extremely unpopular and they continue to do it. And so they always, they're always trying to like get popular support. So if you look at like, look at the event that, that finally got us into uh, the Vietnam War it was the Gulf of Tonkin. Okay. This is an incident which admittedly, this is not a con- conspiracy theory, never happened. Never happened. Uh, look at what got us into uh, World War One. Look at what uh, got us into Iraq. How, how are we sold on getting into Iraq? Iraq had nothing to do with September 11th at all. In fact, yeah. uh, in fact, as, as shitty as Saddam Hussein was, he was actually a nice counter to Al Qaeda in the Middle East. Al Qaeda didn't even exist in, in Iraq, but uh, we use that sentiment, that anger, that oh shit, we're you know we're, we're, we got attacked. We use that, and then of course you know weapons of mass destruction were you know which were never found. So it's all these false premises and pretenses to get us scared to go into war and then people support it and then we go in and this is what, th- that's the clearest thing you can see. And this is with almost every war. Look back and you'll see like, oh, that, you know, uh, Pearl Harbor. Do you know how much evidence there was that we knew that they were going to come in and attack us uh, at Pearl Harbor? Yeah. There's a decent amount of evidence to show that they, we had that radar. people kind of knew, <laughs> well, no, that people kind of knew that they were coming yeah. But, you know, the, the the conspiracy is, and this is less proven than Gulf of Tonkin, but the conspiracy is well, does anything, we let it happen so people get pissed off and we could jump into the does war. Does anything make more money than war? For special interests, it makes a lot of fucking money. That's what I mean. Mm-hmm. Does it? I mean, what Bro, makes think more? about the business of war. It's such, and by the way, it doesn't make American American people money unless you, you're in one of these military industrial complex companies. It loses money. And nothing loses money more than creating a million dollar something and then exploding it. Well, you know they just keep making, yeah, like tanks and planes. Don't they like cement them after a while after they make too many units? Yeah, what happened is the Cold War. Yeah, you can't tell me, too, that somebody who's connected like that, that knows like, okay, way before anybody else knows that we're going to war, that I'm not also investing in Boeing and all these all these companies on the side that I know is because we're going to mandate something, that all of those things are going to go up tenfold. Bro, just look at Donald Rumsfeld I mean, and look how much his his company you know or friends profited from the iraq war um you know it's it's really crazy now i don't know if they're like i you know you can go down the line and be like oh they're making people go to war what i think might even happen what i think is more realistic is we decide we're going to go to war for you know uh, for our own you know reasons and then the the military contractors or the you know these 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 companies that make these weapons influence how we run the war you know what I'm saying? Like they sit down oh, and right. go, okay, Here's we have the strategy. Yeah, based we have off the, our we have this product. Why don't you yeah. guys launch this kind of a, a you know war and use this weapon and then highlight it and whatever mm-hmm. and make that happen. That's but you know here's what happened with the Cold War. You know the, one of the approaches from the you know like the bunker bust. What, one of Reagan's approaches was to outspend the Soviet Union, make them spend so much money that they bankrupt themselves, and it kind of did work. But then we were li- left with this massive military uh, industrial complex and a lot of these you know mo- all of these weapons and whatever they're made in America so now you have entire states or cities that a large percentage of their employment is these companies that make tanks or bombs or whatever so now imagine you're trying to okay we don't we don't have a cold war anymore we don't need to have a huge military now you're trying to cut spending but what you're actually doing is now you're cutting jobs and those people vote for their politicians, their politicians come to DC and they lobby the government to keep those jobs and keep, you know, creating new enemies, right? Whether it's the war on terrorism or the war on whatever. And, and so that we continue to spend more and more and more. So it's, it's a monster because government, you know, programs and in, in, in parts of the government, once they grow, getting them to shrink is almost impossible. It'd be like, it'd be, you know, it's like you're the owner of a business and you have the you have access to unlimited money, and then people ask you to take a voluntary pay cut. Like, no, I'm going to give myself a raise, dude. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's not going to happen. Like, when's the last time Congress voted themselves a pay cut? You <laughs> I know, love that, yeah. you know, they get to vote. Believe it or not, they get to vote their own salaries. How fucking hilarious is that? <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? And they always have it's limitless. Convenient. Yeah. And they have limitless money on top <laughs> yeah. of it. 
it's, that's, that's why politics is is shitty compared to sports. Like sports, you can't cheat like that, dude. And sports, we try, cheat, but we try and cheat. You know, what I'm saying steroids, candles, doing things like that, but not at the level of politics. Yeah, politics yeah. is fucking super cheating, bro. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. super it is. cheating. This quaz brought to you by Organifi. For those days you fall short on getting your organic veggies or whole food nutrition, Organifi fills the gap with laboratory tested certified organic superfoods to help give your health and performance the added edge. Try Organifi totally risk free for 60 days by going to Organifi.com. That's O R G A N I F I.com. And use the coupon code MindPump for 20% off at checkout. All right. Hey, Doug, fir- you know, real quick, whoa, whoa, whoa. I got I to gotta share this with uh the boys here now you know how the other day we were we were all joking around and whatever and we were commenting on um you know like uh, i think justin was talking about getting a vasectomy and how i said that <laughs> no and how i said Usually that topic of, yeah, yeah what was no, that no, no, no. we were jo- sh- we were talking no it wasn't on the show it was off, oh, off oh, was and we were talking and i was joking around and saying oh you could reduce your your semen volume mm. and we were all laughing or yeah. whatever and it's funny because it's gross it's funny because like that's something that for whatever reasons dude guys typically want more yeah. Seminal volume. Okay? Yeah, yeah. You Whatever. want it to really blast. And some girls, hey. Yeah. Anyway, so <laughs> so I, I uh Where's this going? No, no, like, no <laughs> listen. Is, bro. This, is this supposed to be our Organifi commercial? Oh oh no no. Actually, this is a great Organifi commercial. Oh, oh turn yeah. it into a commercial. <laughs> yeah. Huh? yeah. No. Ashwagandha, which is the main ingredient in Organifi green juice, <laughs> yes. increases seminal volume. Oh my God! Finally, <laughs> yes. So you may be Even noticing more reasons. You may notice why, as you're drinking more of the green juice, that you're getting, you're making bigger. Wow, loads. I know. <laughs> Organifi's, I noticed. Gonna, Organifi's gonna love that commercial, <laughs> bro. It was getting closer to the ceiling, bro. I'm gonna pay attention now because yeah. uh, you know, as I drink more of it, I mean. Yeah. I'm gonna look. I like you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep, yeah. keep us posted. That volume. Yeah, yeah. yeah. drink. Yeah. Keep drink. Ju- actually no. Keep Justin posted. Send him. Let him know. I'll send you pictures. I'll bring him my cup. Yeah, drink. <laughs> <laughs> drink Organifi green juice. <laughs> Increase your load volume. Increase the load. I wonder if it turns green. All right. Thank you, Sal. You're welcome, Doug. Our first question is from Oborer. Tips on getting your first chin up or pull up as a female weightlifter. I've been doing negatives, band, and box-assisted pull-ups, scap pulls, and other variations for months, but to no avail. So one of the things I, I, I don't know because they didn't tell us this, but one of the common things that uh, when I help like a female lifter out with pull-ups um, or body weight dips, it, I was actually, in fact, just helping Katrina out with it. The first time ever she, I was ever with her in the gym when she decided she was going to do body weight dips. And she came over and she's like, you know, I, I want to try weighted dips. I know you guys talk about, you know, the importance of increasing that. And I, I don't, I've always just done my body weight. And she goes, I, but I don't think I can do very much weight, you know. And I was like, well, how many how many can you do just just your body weight? And she's like, oh, I can get like 15 plus out of there. I'm oh. like, oh, you can add plenty of weight. God. I, and so she's like, wow. so she would, go grab, she would go grab like a 10. And I'm like, no, no, no. You grab, grab more weight than that. You can do more than a 10. She's like, well, I won't be able to get more than like five or six of those. I'm like, yeah, that's okay. I'm yeah. like, and so Katrina, don't you listen to Mind Pump? The point I know I'm, I'm selling her out right now to sell this to tell the story right now because I, this is common and I, I used to get this a lot with yeah, clients very- and it's part it feeds into the you know we girls can't do low reps because it builds bulky muscle or something. It's like mm-hmm. no, like actually doing. I said you know it'd be great. I said do find find a weight that is hard for you to. I want you to land somewhere between one to three. Mm-hmm. You know, like, have you ever done that? Have you ever strapped on enough weight that to where you know you can only get one to three reps total? And she's like, no, I would never do that. And I'm like, so there you go. So let's put a weight on that. If you get three, keep increasing the weight if, or, or more. So, mm-hmm. you know, I think that a lot of times um, they, they'll they be doing a, doing the banded or assisted or the uh, Gravitron assisted pull-up machine. And they're still doing 10, 15 reps. Now yeah. that can that will help. That'll help you build some strength. But you're going to see a way more bang for your buck if you use s- enough resistance to go oh, heavy. Yeah. Yes, or enough assistance. Well, you're going to teach me. your body the mechanics of the movement and everything, and it's going to respond appropriately. But to be able to now um, activate and and recruit even a louder signal, you know, to to decrease those reps and to really struggle through those reps. Well, right. well, think of it this way: this person, this 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 lady, is trying to get her first uh, pull up, right? So right. she's she's trying to be able to do one. Now, one is is that low reps or high reps, right? It's low reps. So what you're actually trying to That's improve upon, <laughs> you're, what, you know, what you're trying to improve upon is your maximal strength. 
to start with. Now, at some point, if you get good at pull-ups, you'll be doing more and more reps. But remember, there's a rule of specificity when it comes to, uh, to training. In other words, what you train is what you get. And you do get some carryover to other things, but most of the gains and the benefit you get is in the rep range you train, in the exercise you train, and in the, in the style you train. So if your goal is to try and get one pull-up, which is a very low rep and maximal strength because you can't do any at this moment, then you should practice doing one to two or three pull-ups with assistance. That's the point that I was trying to make. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I don't know if I came off Oh, you did. Oh, no, yeah, no, yeah. no, 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 perfect. No, oh, okay. I thought, you were, I thought you were teasing he's me right here. Yeah. No, no, I'm back on I'm, I'm back Yeah, because I mean, that's I would I would put a lot of weight on and use someone to help and assist if I need to, but you're only doing a single or a double at most. I mean, I think that that's what I meant. I think a lot of what I see a lot of times is someone will then get on like an assisted machine or a, use a band and they can get 10, 15 reps with the assisted and they're doing mm-hmm. way too many reps. And you, if you can't do a single one, just your body weight. Way. Yeah, and train that. I mean, for me personally, too, like um, going through that and lowering your reps, um, you tend to find out too where some of your you know sticking points are. The hardest portion of the the rep is, and yeah. where that lies. And so that's you know after you get through those low reps, a lot of times I'll, I'll get into that same position, and whether it's the bottom of my rep, I'm going to really start to increase my tension within the bottom of that rep. So mm-hmm. I'll stay there and like do an isometric rep where I'm just trying to harness as much activity as possible there and squeeze, squeeze, squeeze as hard as I can. And then, you know, make reps out of that just so my body will, you know, it, it'll, it'll further kind of respond the way that you want it to, uh, when you feel like it, you're at your hardest point of the exercise. Right. And it's also, you, you, here's the other thing when you're doing low reps, I think people many times confuse that for maxing out. Mm-hmm. So if I say, okay, you're going to do sets of one or two reps. That's a good point. Then they go pick a weight that that's their max, and it's a super crazy struggle every single set. No, not, that's wrong. Here's what you do. Go to your assisted pull-up machine or whatever and pick a weight that you can max out for four reps on. So let's say four reps is your absolute max. Now do sets of one or two. Go in there. You go in there with a sub-maximal intensity because that's what's going to give you the strength because if you max out the whole time you're just going to create a lot of muscle damage and you're not going to you'll it'll take you a long time to recover but the adaptation signal will be gone by the time you're fully recovered and you're not going to gain any strength so go sub maximal pick a way you can do four reps with do one or two do that practice that and here's the other thing frequency practice yeah. a lot yeah i think if you did honest to god if you did like three sets of a single pull up with a weight that you can do five reps on, for example, and you did that, I don't know, twice a day, every day, watch how fast you get stronger. The It'll other, trip you out. The other thing to take in consideration, too, is this is a strength to weight ratio thing, too. So a lot of times if you shred three or five pounds, like, and then you go do pull-ups again, it's crazy how much that makes a difference, too. Like, if you, I know every time that I've leaned out uh, after I've been training, even though I'm losing strength because I'm catabolic for, you know, quite some time when I'm getting ready for a show, Man, when I go do pull-ups, my I just I fly up there because I've lost five or ten pounds. So you know I don't know how heavy this person is too. If you are, you know, if you're carrying extra body fat on you and you're trying to get good at your pull-ups, like one of the easiest things that you could do is shred a few pounds. Yeah, I, they used to always fool me. By the way, like I I start cutting, and then I do pull-ups and be like, oh shit, I lost like twelve pounds, but I I could do the same amount of pull-ups. I haven't lost any any muscle, and then I'm like, oh wait a minute. I lost 12 pounds, so I'm actually weaker. I can only do 12. I should be able to do like an additional five reps, but I can't because I'm skinny. Next question is from Cellcarp. What are your thoughts on running in combo with resistance training? I lift five times a week, but also enjoy running because I'm near many state parks and it's therapeutic. How much running each week is too much and begins to inhibit muscle building? This uh, th- this is a good question because you know how we talk about all the time how f- a while ago people started confusing exercise with it just needs to be hard and you sweat and you need to get sore. And so people stopped treating it like a skill, stopped practicing it, and instead went to the gym to mm-hmm. quote unquote work out. And so it was no longer about form or the right exercises. It was all about like how hard can I make this, how much can I sweat, and how much how sore can I get. And that's what fucks people up because you're, you're – the body doesn't respond well that way. You want to go in, you will learn the skill and practice like any other sport. It's worse with running. It's way worse with running. I don't know anybody that starts running 
and thinks to themselves, like, I'm going to perfect running. I'm going to perfect the skill of running. No, I don't even know in physical education, like any coaches that have like done a good job of teaching running mechanics, you know, with students, they just go, Mm -hmm. you know, it's just like, go and run, run as much as you can. Yeah. Or as hard as you can. That's it. And like just endurance based. Let's see how much you can endure. It's if you go and you run hard or you run long and you exhaust yourself, you are assuming whether you realize it or not, you are assuming that you have great uh, running patterns and mechanics. Yeah. Because the only thing you should ever train to fatigue or hard is something that you really want to solidify in your body. And if you have poor mechanics, that's what you're solidifying. And so what we see, we just saw this today as we walked in for, to the studio, this young lady was running by and it looked gruesome. Poor girl, she's dying, she's sweating, she can't even look up at anybody. Forward shoulder, forward head. Feet are hitting the floor all over the place. Lean as fuck. Yeah, and she's just and, and you know she's just going for the the intensity, like how long or how hard I can run. But I can look at her and I can predict with pretty good accuracy. What do you guys think? How long do you think it'll take before she could she has to stop because she hurt herself? Five more years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe. Yeah, maybe uh, less. Sometimes less. Right, sometimes right. a lot less. Yeah. But this is where you get you know those kind of and problems. She was young. She was really young. And yeah, she, she was, was young. young. So yeah. she's resilient right now. Yeah. yeah. So, so when it comes to running, like if you run really really well, that's number one, and that's okay. But here's number two: how much running is too much, and then it inhibits muscle gains. Well. Technically, if you run and it improves your general health, that'll probably build more muscle. Anything past that will inhibit muscle. Anything which, that tells your body to become more That's really nerd. vague and hard. Uh, <laughs> I know. How, how different is that from person to yeah. person, right? Well, and that, I just, when I answer that to people, I just ask them which one's more of a priority. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It's like if you're really trying to build muscle, then almost any bit of car- cardio is not that advantageous. And I know there's studies to prove that increasing cardio can increase muscle mass. And that's because, like Sal was saying, you're healthier. Mm-hmm. Your body's functioning better at that point. Your, your heart is stronger. So therefore, you can then in turn build more muscle. But once you get to a point where the running is making you sore or the running is you know for long duration of time and you can't keep up the the caloric count like then well then- we're assuming too that they're talking about like endurance running versus like you know short sprints and short bursts mm-hmm. um which i've actually done you know in, in combination with heavy lifting um mainly to emulate a lot of the durability I need, you know, for performance on the field. And so having quick bursts, but having, in, you know, being able to um, get back up and have the endurance and gas tank to keep motoring forward and having like a fast twitch response. But I wasn't teaching my body to just go on and on and on and on and on. Cause that when I'm heavier, that is a disadvantage. Mm-hmm. Right. And so that's a conflict of information. I'm telling my body. No, that's it's a great point. A, it's a really fine dance for somebody like this. Cause I, I, I also don't like, discouraging somebody who has found this love for running and and exercising where you're exercising five to seven days a week and you know and and they're saying it's therapeutic yeah and it's you know you're right you're, so why so, you, it's not like we're trying to take that away from yeah you, right? i would yeah. never do that right i would never if a client came to me and said like they were they're happy they're they're at where they want to be goal wise give or take and they're they're they enjoy running because it's therapeutic I would totally allow them to do it. Now, if I'm looking at you and you've I, you've got all these injuries that I know are going on, and then I know you're going out and running on that, then which I have just had this conversation with a friend of mine that's like a trail runner, you know, and he's got fucking hip issues, he's got low back issues, and he just wants to run all the time. And I'm just like, well, yeah, you could. He's asking me for permission, basically. And oh, don't t- you love that? Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, like well, you do what you want, dude. But yeah. I'm not going to sign off on it. Right, yeah. right, exactly. You can do whatever you want, but you're just you're not in the. Con- you have no business, in my opinion, running because you're all this wear and tear on your body. Like it's coming from that. And mm-hmm. I know you don't think that because you get the instant relief from when you actually do the run, and it feels like it feeds a part of you that you like so much. But it's you're also taking away another part of you, which is the wear and tear on your joints yeah, and, and your body. And people want. It, obviously, people want everything, right? But it doesn't work that way. There's there's definitely trade offs. So you got to mm-hmm. ask yourself this, and I'm uni- I'm going to use an arbitrary number, okay? But just think of it this way: what will bring you? What brings you mo- uh, a better or higher quality of life? Five extra pounds of muscle, or the fact that you can go run in state parks and find therapy in it? Just ask yourself that question. If the answer is Oh well, five pounds more muscle will give you a better quality of life. Then there you go. Then then do more weight training and do less running. If it's the opposite, then is the five pounds of muscle worth the trade? Of course it is. Quality of life. I mean, 
you know, that's that's that trumps everything. That doesn't matter then at that point. Right. Extra five pounds of muscle or better quality of life. There's your because I can see I can see and I know how it is when when I was getting ready for a show. What I love part of what I loved about competing was, you know, I was so regimented, and that's an extreme, right? Like that's not healthy to live that live that way for a long time. But to me, I have found some things in it that I really appreciate, and it was like this organized structure of my program. It was this structure of me doing cardio X amount of times in the week when I was getting ready. And like that also bled into the rest of my day. I was, I was more productive. And I, so I saw these things, even though, okay, I might be training a little more on the extreme level, but I'm also getting some major benefits in the rest of my life. So, okay, I might overdo this a little bit, but then I'm also seeing it bleed over and other things that I'm, I know that are valuable to me. So, you know, it's, it's a give and take on all these mm -hmm. things. And so it's really hard to tell somebody like, what the 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 right dose is it's like yeah. you you have to make that decision for you how much you want doing it but there, i definitely think there's some things that you have to be very very honest with yourself and if you deal with any sort of low back knee issues already or if and, you just run terrible well that's i mean yeah. you're if you've had those things you are running yeah, terrible yeah. bottom line by the way saying? pain is one of the last signals that you end up getting. right and that's what i'm saying but if that's what i'm saying that it you could be running and not have any pain right now and still not be doing good good work for your body yeah you're, you're just waiting for i'm the saying if you if you've already got pain going on you yeah. know what i'm saying if just, you've already got issues going on like that like then absolutely it's going to compile yes yeah. just keep this in mind and understand this whatever you do a lot of your body aims to become good at it be, it aims to become efficient at it aims to become proficient at and so when you're doing lots of running think about what your body will have to especially longer distance running right i'm not talking about sprinting here longer distance running what type of things would your body need to do to make itself better at running well one of them is uh improve your cardiovascular endurance improve your muscular endurance so those are those are kind of givens um, it's going to uh, make it make you more of an efficient running machine, which means you can't be too heavy, right? More weight on your body makes you not as efficient. And nothing burns as many calories per – I mean, running burns a ton of calories. That's, that's the truth, right? If you run for an hour, you're going to burn more calories in that hour than if you lift weights, just the bottom line. Um, but, so your body now is also learning to become efficient – with calories because you are trying to turn your body into a machine that has lots of stamina, lots of endurance, but also doesn't use a lot of gasoline because that would be that would be a bad thing. That would be that would be not as efficient. So you're turning yourself into a over time a skinny, slower metabolism type of individual, which isn't necessarily bad. Actually, it's not bad. That's what you're asking your body to do, so it does create that. Now, building muscle or lifting weights does the opposite. If I'm lifting weights, I'm looking for strength. Um, and with some of that strength, needs more muscle size because bigger muscle fibers contract harder. Bigger muscles do, do burn more calories, but that's okay because I don't burn a lot of calories lifting weights anyway. And the, and the signal that I'm sending that's, that's being prioritized is strength anyway. That's the one that's causing most of the damage or whatever or that my body seems to be responding to. So you get a faster metabolism. So these are the things you want to weigh out when you're combining training modalities. And I mean, here's my view. If you're looking for overall health, you're better off doing a lot of a little, you're better off doing a little bit of everything and worse off doing a lot of just one thing. Right. But quality of life, like for me, for example, do I have an improved quality of life if I lift weights and get strong versus if I do long distance running? For me, I do because I enjoy it way more. Yeah. I don't enjoy long distance running that much. So that's the other thing you want to keep in mind. Next up is Evans11. Is it possible to integrate a MAPS program in a three-day-a-week Olympic lifting program? Oh, the best, mm. the program, if you're an Olympic lifter, and Olympic lifting is very specific, it's very unique in all forms of resistance training. Most resistance training requires control or, or, t or slower tempo, mm -hmm. more ten time under tension. Dude, MAPS Prime would be dope. 100% for, MAPS, MAPS Prime. MAPS Prime would be dope for Dude, an Olympic lifter. MAPS lifting. Prime would benefit an Olympic lifter tremendously. Oh, yeah. I mean, think about it. When Channeling your central nervous system, oh. like everything on command, like that's all part of the, the, the training protocol in Prime. I mean, it's really just getting your body to respond the way it's – most effectively going to respond and we put you in positions specifically so that communication channel gets opened up the floodgates open in a sense yeah well look at look at olympic lifters look at high level olympic lifters 
They're definitely muscular, but they're not massive. Um, and I mean, in comparison to a other power lifter, yeah, like like an Olympic lifter, a hundred and fifty pound top level Olympic lifter is twice as strong mm. as the top bodybuilders in the world. And it's a very high skill to achieve. Yeah, and what you're asking your body, of course, your muscles need to fire hard and fully, but power lifters do that too. Mm -hmm. But what you're also asking upon your body is this perfect recruitment pattern of muscles firing in a particular sequence to get the it's so much skill is involved in Olympic mm -hmm. lifting in comparison to other lifts. It's it's not even there's no comparison. It's I the mean, fast loose concept. Too. Yes. So I mean Pavel talks about this, but um it's a it's a it's a tough it's a tough thing to um to articulate to athletes a lot of times because um, especially if you've come from a strength or bodybuilding kind of a background where you have to learn how to be loose on command. Oh, it's way opposite of bodybuilding. Bodybuilding where you're taught to be keep tension the tension entire the, the whole entire, time. the whole time and it's the opposite. Yeah. yeah. It's the exact opposite. I was training I was teaching uh Jessica how to do a, a dumbbell snatch. And she's only ever lifted weights with with you know when, when it comes to weights in terms of like like a bodybuilder or you know with resistance, right? To you know to sculpt or or, or build muscle. And so I'm trying to teach her, got, you got to be fast but under control. And she she started off like everybody who ever tries to do an Olympic li lift after they've lifted weights Just, for uh, years, like muscle it's it up. super slow. Yeah, it's like it's, a yeah. – and you're trying, I'm trying to teach her to be fast and explosive, and, and it's a skill. And right. here's the thing, like if, you're, if you do Olympic lifts, you know this better than anybody. When you go in to get your lift, you want to hit that lift with the perfect sequence. You don't right. have – you don't have – you don't even have one degree of fucking up – in terms of getting the right lift, maximizing how much weight you can lift, and minimizing injury. And so how you set yourself up to do that lift is extremely important. Well, this is why I got so into biomechanics and uh, you know, and, and mobility and um, overall quality of movement because when you look at athletics, it matters so much more than just the raw ability to – you know, strength and, and, and be able to summon this like really loud strength. Yeah. But how are you going to use that? How are you going to channel that? How are you going to include the rest of your limbs in the movement? How are you going to add anchor points where now I'm stopping preventing certain like, you know, parts of my body to anchor down and to maintain this anti-rotation while the rest of my body's rotating. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a very complex concept, but once you start to you know, really understand that you can have optimal points of tension in each movement. And that's, and that's the part that's like, that's next level where you start understanding that as an athlete, I can be loose and then boom, mm. you know, tight when I need it. Till this day of all the, the programs that we've written, MAPS Prime for, is the one that I consider like the, the, the best. And I don't mean the best in terms of it's better than the other programs. It's the most unique and revolutionary that it, we created. For yeah, sure. it's, it required yeah, for sure. It required the three of us to get into. Oh, well, I remember even a flow state like yeah. we'd never done with. I mean, we had to fucking turn it on to figure it out. Right. To really figure well, out because it's complex and we're trying to present it to your average person. So it's you know it really took a lot of thought. Well, priming. Here's the thing that people need to understand is that is there priming for specific lifts? General priming. Yeah, there is. Uh, but it's it's not even in the same universe as priming your individual body oh it's mm -hmm. definitely not it's not close. the same thing no. so if you have you know particular imbalances or recruitment patterns or tight muscles or loose muscles or whatever you if you prime your individual body based on how you move the right way you will maximize your specific performance tremendously and mm -hmm. what you do to prime your body can be drastically different than how you prime someone else. I'll tell you something right now. The way I prime my body for squats and deadlifts is very different than the way Justin would prime his body. And I know this because we both have different mm -hmm. mobility patterns. Different and rituals, you know, if we call them, you know, going into the lifts, it's, it's all part of it. And if I did my priming like his, it would be better than nothing, but it wouldn't be nearly as good as the one I do for myself and vice versa. And so that's what MAPS Prime does is you go in there and there's something we, we you know, we created called the compass test. And you take this test, and basically it's three movements that we came up with as the best movements that you can do that will help identify the right way to prime your body. You do this test, you, you pass or fail, then you figure out, okay, these are the best priming movements for my specific body. And when you do them, they turn on the right muscles, they get the right muscles to chill out a little bit, they create the right recruitment pattern, and then your lift, it's like... 
It's like going into a lift and feeling like you're in the groove right away, like mm-hmm. better than you've ever felt before. Now, think about Olympic lifting. Can you think of uh, any type of resistance training type of activity that requires you be in the fucking groove more than Olympic lifting? I mean, as complex as a barbell squat is, uh, I would, I would, <laughs> a barbell squat's not even the same page in terms of getting in the right groove movement right. as Olympic lifting. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so try doing a clean and jerk or a snatch, you know, like it's, it's so, that's why I, I guess I had such a venom when, when I see it. CrossFit. Um, yeah. Just thrown into a circuit. Like it's just completely devalues that exercise and what the intent of the exercise is for. Right. So, well, and we know that over 80% of the population have no business doing it. No. Oh yeah. Absolutely just, not. They just oh, yeah. you're just not you're not there yet. You're, that doesn't mean that nobody in you're the, at the top of the pyramid. That doesn't mean that there's people that get uh, that can't do it and or they should never do it. That's not what I'm saying. I think there's there's so much dysfunction in us and I think that that is getting worse because yeah. of our habits of sitting and rounding forward on the computer and the desk and the phone and all that there's shit. There's people like, that can't even do a proper overhead press that are snatching. Right. Yeah, no. Which drives me insane. Yeah, right. no. It's it's a, it's a it's a high skill activity. Getting into the groove is so important and I'll make this point right now. If I was going to teach a kid how to throw a baseball, of course I'd just have him throw a baseball, right? But that's not that's not the full answer. That's not 100% the answer. I would teach them how to throw the baseball correctly. And then they would practice throwing it correctly over and over again. Because if I took a kid Mm -hmm. and I taught him to throw a baseball like a shot put, and that's what he practiced, or that's what she practiced all the time. They'll get good at that would specific they, movement. They, would they ever get good at really throwing a baseball in a ba- no. by playing you know in a, in a baseball game? They'd be terrible at yeah. throwing a baseball because they, all they've ever practiced is this terrible technique. Well, with Olympic lifting, you can go do all the snatches and cleans you want, but if your technique is off by a little, if you're not in the groove, if you didn't prime properly, and you're just going through the movement, you'll never get really good at Olympic lifting because you never. You're not practicing good Olympic lifting. If you prime properly, that's what you get good at. You get good at good Olympic lifting or good, you know, squatting or deadlifting because it's also obviously for other types of training. And so it's going to make you better. It's going to get you better faster by priming properly. And so with Olympic lifting, the the truth is, I think everybody should prime any kind of workout that they do. Doesn't matter what it is. Mm-hmm. You know, running, swimming, lifting weights, whatever. But the one, some the Olympic lifting has to rank among the top of how important it is to prime uh, it's, properly. I, it's funny this came up too. I, uh, I had a, one of our listeners, Susan, send me this video of this girl doing a deadlift, and she's going through all these robotic movements. And she was just asking me, "Can you explain what is she doing?" And I, you know, I was just helping uh, one of Katrina's friends with her deadlift, and. The mechanics on these movements, and that's not even an Olympic lift. That's not even an explosive lift that you're throwing up over your head. That's just a plain old deadlift. And I'm like, you see all the way she gets her, her foot in, then she gets her hands and shoulders in position, her neck in position, retracts, slides the hips back. I mean, all that is, in, is important to get her prime her body to get in the perfect position to lift that weight. And so it's funny we ended up answering this question because she literally sent that to my DM yesterday, and that was what I was trying to get across to her is that, yeah, it looks funny and silly, and a lot of people make fun of people that have these little rituals before they do that, but they're priming their body. It's right. just it's no different than the way a baseball player walks up to mm-hmm. a plate and he dusts his cleats off, he throws a bat over his shoulder, he tips mm-hmm. his cap, and he spits on the ground. Like Spitting has nothing to do with his baseball. <laughs> that's, that's, that's priming his brain. Yeah, at least, it right? is. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Exactly. It's getting him into that flow state but, where he can yeah. Yeah, sort of but, avoid all that. But you know, priming is spe- even more specific than that because it would be him in the dugout practicing swinging the bat or working on the muscles that he knows he needs to work on in order right. to Well, yeah, to we have built, right we've built in the fortification sessions in there too, so there's lots of work. Everything, yeah. everything. And, and it, uh, here's, a, here's the thing, look, I'll tell you, and I, I guarantee you this, in five to ten years, all personal trainers will know priming very, very well. But today, if you're a trainer now and you want to separate yourself from your peers, if you want to be a trainer that's like, oh shit, that trainer's different than everybody and he knows shit that nobody else knows, learn how to prime your clients properly before the workouts because 
it's still right now a lot of trainers don't do it. And, oh, if and, you're if, by now, I think I've said this like three or four times. If you're a fucking trainer and you're listening to this show, you should own Prime and Prime Pro, hands down. If you don't, that's ridiculous. And it's it's the fact that too you get your money back guarantee on top of that. So it's a no brainer. And I for sure, hands down, when we designed all the programs, I remember sitting down. I remember us going like. God, we know what we need to provide for everybody, but we know that nobody's ready for this yet. If we would have came out with Prime as the very first program, it would have lost so many people that they would have been like, this, sure. this, this program sucks. Just give me something that makes me sweat or works me out. Yeah. But we all knew that it, it, it should go with every program that we have. So even if, if you have any of the MAPS programs, if Prime isn't involved in that or Prime Pro isn't involved in that, that's really the assessment tool that each and every one of us, it really, it's the knowledge between the three of us of everything mm -hmm. that we've accumulated over all this. Yeah, and Brink, right? So you add Brink in the mix too, have all put together on if we had somebody, if we had somebody sitting in front of us, what would we do to figure out what this person, how they should get ready before every single lift and workout? And that's how we develop Prime and Prime Pro, man. That's a no brainer. Next question is from K Cody RN. Which one of you has the most muscle mass or lean body mass? <laughs> what kind of bullshit? Well, let's who, see. Picked that, who picked that question? That's a this, sow question. It wouldn't, right? it wouldn't even be Ooh. close if I was competing. But even right now, I'm, uh, mm. I'm at 215 weight, and I'm probably sitting. I'm fat right now, so I'm probably sitting around. I'm fat for me. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to offend somebody who's not uh, lower than 15 or 16% body fat. I'm probably around 15% body fat, so you can figure that out. 215. 15% body fat. You can figure out my lean body mass if you know how to figure it out. Do you out. remember when we went and did the the test, the body fat test, all of us, at, what's his name, the the supplement store? Oh, that was over in South uh, San Jose. Yeah, yeah, and now it's electronic impedance, so it's not going to be the most accurate, but it gives you a general kind of idea, and I love it when Adam threw it off just by eating carbs. That was awesome. Yes. <laughs> but we, we all- Hacked the system. We all went over there and we tested it, and then then it could tell you what your lean body mass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that's when we we all did that. I'm gonna say Doug. Yeah, that's probably. My vote. No, are we talking about pound for pound, or what are they asking? Which no, is I think most... who has the most lean body mass. I don't know. That's a t that's a good question well, because it's well, it's easy. Just figure out. You know about what percent body fat you are, right? Yeah, I'm probably at like nine okay. right now. So and like how that. much do you weigh? Hundred one ninety six. So do do that. So yeah. that's. 19 pounds of fat on you so you're probably sitting about 180 175 you're about 175 lean mass i'm probably sitting about 190 justin's probably it's hard to know what Ju justin do you know what your yeah, body is really, yeah I'm, he's, he's really fat, fat so, so it's hard to tell <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like at least 19 to 20 who knows yeah I, but i'm like two i'm like 230 consistently damn yeah that is a lot of cakes. It, you know, you're not. No, hold on. You don't look like we all joke around. You're yeah, fat, yeah. whatever. You're not that. You're not obviously a massive. No, I dude, carry it well. But you got yeah. a lot of. Yeah. You all have the, a lot all of the, <laughs> all the good places, ladies. I'm like, yeah. It, it all goes in the right spots. spots. Damn, bro. Hey, no, you imagine no, this guy no. running barreling not at you full ladies. speed. We're actually probably all of us are probably pretty close to the same lean mass, give or take. I would say five or ten pounds yeah. right now for sure. At this moment, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. when I was all yeah, when, you're when I'm jacked yeah. on gear and fucking walking, and, you're tall too. Yeah, I was t I was up at two thirty, and then when I'd hit stage at two fifteen was my last pro show, and I was three percent body fat. So I'm two hundred shredded. Yeah, two hundred ten pounds of lean body mass on me, which I mean, you don't even weigh that, so you no, have no, that. no, yeah, no. so. But I mean, right now I'm maybe sitting on probably 180, 190 pounds of lean mass. Yeah, I like the lean body mass question because not necessarily for us, but for people listening, because especially guys who try to bulk all the time, it's a good thing to, to know about yourself because you, the scale can fool you. Actually, no, no, this is a great question for everybody, including women. How many times have you had a female client lose weight on the scale, be super like, ah, but you know she's doing it wrong. You test her body fat and you show her, oh, actually your body fat percentage stayed the same, which means you've lost... Yeah. Well, remember this, this much lean body mass. You gain lean body mass. You yeah. remember the story it. that I shared on here with my uh, client friend Jessica, who competed, and when I told her I didn't want her to compete yet because her metabolism wasn't ready, and she went on and kind of did it later on on her own with a friend, and she did her body fat test at at the end of the show, and she didn't want to see it till after she got off stage, and then we sat and we looked at it together, and when we looked at it her body fat percentage like stayed the same and she lost like 20 some pounds. There it is. And so she just, she took off as much muscle as she took off body yeah. fat. And that's, that's crazy. That's man. Tough. People yeah. wonder that by the way, how can you lose weight and your body fat percentage stay the same or go up? What you need to understand is it's body fat percentage is a percentage of your body weight. So if you're a hundred pounds and you have, you know, 10% body fat, that means you have 10 pounds of body fat on you. If you lose, you know, 15 pounds of muscle, but you still have 
10 pounds of body fat. Well, now it's 10 pounds out of, you know, what is that, 85. So you now have a higher body fat percentage. Even though you didn't gain any pounds of body fat, it's a greater percentage of your, old, of your total this, body that's weight. That's why the scale is such a terrible indicator. It's stupid. Of it gives you false, like, how many, I've, I, I've done this with, with female clients. I'll, they'll wait, oh, I lost 10 pounds. I'm so happy I lost 10 pounds. And I'll test their body fat and I'll be like, your body fat percentage actually went up. And they'll be like, what do you mean I lost weight? I'll be like, well, you, you might have lost a couple pounds of fat, but you also lost a lot of muscle. Mm-hmm. So now more of your body is body fat than before because you've lost a lot of your body. And along with losing body mass is you're not going to be able to burn as many calories. Well, and this is most typical in people when they first get started on their kick, right? So mm-hmm. they're, I'm out of shape. I haven't been training. It's all it's just the winter, the holidays came around. Okay, now I'm going to kickstart my fitness, right? And they come out the gates, balls to the wall. They tighten up the diet like crazy. Well, this like, is where you see the aggressive cardio people kind yeah. of struggle with that, right? Yeah. That's when you see this happen. So like when, and, and it, that's the extreme version and there's everything in between too. There's some people that think they're not pushing that harder and they think they're doing it right, but they still are too because maybe they're not feeding the body properly. I see that a lot. Uh, like yeah. maybe you're not killing it on cardio and dealing the gym, but you're also restricting calories. You were eating 2,500 or 3,000 calories that were fucking terrible choices. And then all of a sudden you went from that. So your body's now used to 2,500 to 3,000 shitty calories. Now all of a sudden you cut it to 1,800 calories and you're eating lean and clean and your body's probably utilizing most of that shit. Like you're you're not feeding it enough to keep up. And then it, what ends up happening is you drop 10 pounds in that week and in your head you think you did a good job because the scale's dropping and you ultimately want to lose body fat but then you find out that you lost you know you lost 10 pounds and maybe some of it was good you lost four pounds of fat but then six pounds of it was muscle and water and other things so you've got a, a body fat percentage that actually can technically go up even though you're reducing your calories and you've lost 10 pounds super common yeah i mean if you're telling your body to become more efficient with calories it's going to want to uh, reduce your muscle mass. Your your muscle mass is the biggest, your skeletal muscle is the biggest calorie burner in your body, um, arguably, right? Uh, not per pound. I think the brain per pound of, of mass burns the most calories, but total, because there's so much muscle, skeletal muscle on your body, that's the biggest calorie burner. And incidentally, it's also something that your body can manipulate quite a bit. Like the last things that you'll lose to save calories are organs, mass, and brain mass, because you really fucking need those things. But muscle mass, you can get rid of a lot of muscle mass and still function and be okay. And so if you're telling your body to be efficient with calories by eating very, very little calories, doing lots of endurance type activity that requires lots of efficiency and also requires you to be kind of light, then what you'll happen is your body will adapt in a way that reduces your muscle mass. Now, what do a lot of people's fat burning routines look like? Exactly that. I'm only eating 1,200 calories a day and I'm doing tons of cardio every single day. Well, you are telling your body to reduce its muscle mass. That's 100% what you're doing, and that is exactly what will happen. And here's the shitty part about it, because maybe someone's saying, like, I don't care if I lose six pounds of muscle as long as I lose four, four pounds of fat. Fine, fair enough. I get that. But here's the situation you've put yourself into now. Now- is adding rocks to your Now pants. you got to eat less oh, just mm-hmm. to stay that way. Now you need to be more disciplined with food, and which is which is, again, fair enough. That's fine, but- you know, you live in a in a time where highly palatable, easily accessible food is around all over the place. And yeah, it's food, a shitty place to be. Yeah, you don't want to necessarily. I mean, that's a great place to be if you're like surviving in the wilderness. Like, oh yeah, it's cool if my body adapts to to be off less calories. It's I'm better at survival. But you know, you live if you live in a, a regular city in America. Um, do you want a, a super highly efficient body that will gain weight at anything over a thousand calories? Yeah, well, if you plan on eating a thousand calories for the rest of life, I guess it's okay. But but shit, we celebrate with food. We do all kinds of things with food. Foods around us. I don't know about you guys, but I like to have a little bit more of a of a cushion so I can every once in a while do that. Yeah, doing as not, little you know, as possible. Doing as little as possible to elicit the most amount of change applies to nutrition the same way that applies to the lifting weights. So no, it's the same thing. I think that you, if you were eating, and I tell this to clients all the fucking time. If you are somebody who is off the wagon, because this is typical, right? You're, most people are on or off. I'm not speaking to some competitive bodybuilder right now. I'm talking about everybody else is 
on or off the diet. When they're off the diet, they're eating fucking fast food. They're not paying attention to the nutrients that their body is getting. They're not moving very much. They're not weight training. So much is not going on. Just the simple fact of you starting to introducing weight training into your life and being yeah, consistent. don't do anything else. Yeah, literally, just don't do anything else yet, and then start you know, and then start to take the big rocks out of your nutrition plan. Like if you're eating fast food and shit that's not ideal for you, just switch it out for better choices. But still eat when you're hungry. Feed the body. Fuel it. If it's like I don't want any of my clients feeling hungry at all when they're first making this new change of lifestyle and and you build upon that you come out the gates you throw everything at it right away nutrition is a, is, is a hard one so so go I, I you know I always tell people like start slow step by step because you have no idea how skewed your understanding of nutrition is and you, you don't understand how dysfunctional your understanding of nutrition is it, I just witnessed this yesterday I talked mm-hmm. about my my daughter's uh, uh, performance right the talent show. And they have a little snack shack over there. So I see, you know, at intermission and afterwards, all these kids lined up and parents buying their kids candy to celebrate. Now, my ex did the same thing. She bought my kids some candy. So my kids get out of line. They they, they come over with their candy and I'm looking at them. And each kid has a full bag of Skittles. Now, the average person is like, oh, it's just a treat, right? It's not a big deal. A full bag of Skittles is something like 75 grams of sugar or something ridiculous. Like, a, like an insane amount of, it's like two cokes, of sugar that you're giving a small child. And, and, you know, I'm not being a food Nazi here. It's just we're so skewed with our understanding of nutrition that we don't think that that's a big deal. But that's a lot for two adults to right. eat. Per Let body alone. weight. It's just yeah. like, it's ridiculous. It's so much. Like, your body has to deal with that massive influx of of sugar all at once and it's a little body with a little pancreas with a little bit of you know insulin you know, production and I'm like holy and I see all these kids and parents so you don't re- and I'm using an easy example like you you don't realize how skewed your 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 mentality well, everybody is says they're they're eating healthy yeah everybody says they're eating healthy and they don't really do that much yeah. bad stuff yeah <laughs> every fucking single person I've ever had oh says that 100 pounds away until they somewhere. write it down and they were like oh really yeah, you think yeah. A caramel popcorn is a good idea, And that's idea, typically what, again, what I always go back to is just track for a week or yeah, two. Yeah, start super slow. Yeah, just pay attention. I'm like, most people, again, you're right. They think they're eating well, and they're just unaware of what the fuck they're doing. It's like, just become aware. Totally unaware. Be, just becoming aware of what you're doing already, you'll see you naturally will start to make better choices because you start to feel guilty. You feel bad like you're, how you're feeding yourself. Like, oh shit, I'm claiming that I'm eating well, but then I'm looking down at my fucking food track here, and I'm like... Oh fuck! I'm not eating well at all. <laughs> Dude, you know, so I, what am I really doing? And the other people, you 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 know, is the the bulkers. You know, pay attention to the, to lean body mass too. I learned this. I, I didn't care about getting lean ever. Uh, you know, through growing up working out because I was skinny. I wanted to gain weight. I remember learning this lesson when I bulked really hard. I got my body weight up to like two forty one or two forty or two thirty nine. Right around two forty, which I don't have a big structure, so that's a lot of fucking weight and i remember being so proud of myself like i got a 240 i'm fucking big yeah and then i got my body fat tested Hoss. and then i looked at the lean body mass that i had gained and it was like not even a third or i think it was like a fourth of the weight <laughs> that i gained was 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 muscle and same. all of it Do-boy. was fat yeah. same exact thing happened to me so a layer of dough one of the, it was right when we started getting into the dunk take when aaron was coming around with the fitness wave and i was on a heavy bulk and I remember it was like I, I remember setting my mind out like okay I'm ne- like this is when I tell you guys the stories of you know the finishing the night off with McDonald's I could crush two Subway sandwiches <laughs> yeah. for lunch Rockstar yeah. wash it down with like like I was just I witnessed it crushing yeah, food right a monster aggressive. yeah. And I'm so glad you and I weren't like super good friends back then. <laughs> I don't think we would have survived. Oh, we yeah. would have fed into We would have pushed. Other. Oh, so oh yeah. I, and I lived with Mark for a while, and him and I would do the same thing. We push push each other. We we used to call each other out. You haven't eaten it. I've already eaten three times. You yeah, pussy. No, no. Yeah, yeah, you're a yeah. pussy. I've already. Eaten, I've <laughs> or your eaten. friends in line before you at the get, getting a burrito, and you or you or you order yours, and then he orders his extra meat. You're like fuck. Right. Yeah. Gotta get that extra. We used meat. to eat, we used to eat like that. Yeah, we used to, we used to eat like that and try and gained so aggressively and i remember when i started tracking with the the dunk tank it was you know it being as accurate as it is and consistent i could look back at all the times i tested and i remember how aggressively i was trying to get my weight up and all i cared about was the weight i just want to see that 240 <laughs> 240 plus mark 
And I remember seeing my body fat percentage and seeing how much lean body mass I was. I was like, wait a second. You mean tell me I fucking worked this hard to put 25 pounds on and like three of it was muscle? <laughs> no. I was like, what? <laughs> like, are you fucking kidding me right yeah. now? Like, oh, dude, that was like so depressing, man. Yeah. You see that? It's super common in gyms with people who lift weights. So, yeah, putting on you put on five pounds of just lean body mass. And you see a pretty significant change in your body. Speed, it doesn't require shit ton of calories. It's the thing. That's what it is. Yeah. It's that I want to, I mean, for me, if you were to ask me back, if you were probably would have told me the science back then, I probably would still fucking be doing the same shit anyways because right. I was filling my shirts out. People were, oh my God, you look jacked. You look big. And so that it's feeding the ego. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's covering up the insecurity of being the skinny guy. So yeah, I'd rather be a little softer and fatter, and but yeah. bigger and buff, right? So yeah, no, I think that's something you got to go through. You know what I'm saying? Excellent. I think if that's an insecurity of yours, you got you to gotta, you gotta work your way through it. You know? Look at your lean body mass. Uh, check it out. If you go to the App Store, you can download the Mind Pump Media app. It's totally free. It allows you to search for any topic within any of our episodes. Go get it now. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump. <laughs>